So I've begun recording of the meeting uh, for this workshop session. Um, at this point, it looks like we've got the, the panel or the attendees there mostly are the people I'm going to bring in as panelists. Um, but if there's anyone who has any public comment during during this, um, please uh, click the raised hand and we will uh, we will be able to recognize you through the meeting. So let me go, I'm going to go ahead, commissioners, and bring in uh, bring in our attendees. Should be Brooke. Hi, Brooke. Hi, good afternoon. How are you all? Welcome. Good. Thank you. Look at that. All right. Ladies, good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right, Jen, uh, I don't know if Jen's is loading. I'm here, it's loading. Oh, good, okay. All right. well, whenever you're ready with the video, that's fine. So getting the cow ready for the background. Yeah. That's right. So commissioners, I think you know all, all four of the people I've brought on here, Brooke Smith from United Way, Karen Grove from the uh, Chamber of Commerce, Susan Everly from the Economic Development Corporation, and Jennifer Cuso from Visit Lebanon Valley. Uh, I'll just do a little bit of an intro here and let you know what we're hoping to accomplish at today's workshop and hopefully uh, something tomorrow at the county commissioners meeting and when we get into to the uh, the substance of the of the documents that we've provided to you in terms of the application the faq the rubric and so on i'll rely pretty heavily on on this panel who has worked very very hard on this I guess it was um, probably back in June already that we started to get together on this, anticipating the CARES Act funding coming through the state. There's Jen. Uh, anticipating that CARES funding being um, applied by June 15th, delivered by July 15th, and we worked on it, I think, weekly and sometimes twice a week, and uh, to, to come up with a, a program that you can make available to businesses, nonprofits, tourism, um, and uh, businesses of, of varying sizes for some relief. As you all know, just rehash that briefly, the uh, application went in for the CARES money. Um, we patiently waited. We learned that uh, Lebanon County was going to be held back from the funding and um, the county through negotiations successfully obtain the money now. So we've got, um, sorry about that. Um, so we obtained that and we're now at a point where we believe it's time to start uh, making this funding available to the businesses and various entities, nonprofits, tourism, and so on. So somebody have music on? It's actually outside of my window on H Street. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm like, what is that? It. it sounds like a monkey, you know, one of those grinder monkeys or something. Yeah, it's, uh, we have entertainment and a meeting, right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, we, we did rely heavily on uh, the colleagues and the, and the partner organizations of the people that you see sitting here uh, in other counties. There was, you know, one one advantage, I guess, to being uh, a little behind the the uh, curve on this money was that some others had already done a lot of work to develop their programs and even roll it out in the case of Lancaster County. So a lot of the materials were available and they were willing to share, which we're grateful for. And um, we were able to just sort of uh, tailor it and tweak it for Lebanon County. Um, it's not exactly a mirror of everything the other counties are doing. It was also tweaked so that it works for Lebanon County, the rubric uh, to some extent, the, um, the FAQ and, and even the application. So all of those were. Um, I know that you haven't had a, a, a lot of time to look over these, but what we're hoping to do today is introduce to you the, uh, the program and how generally it would work a little bit on the timeline of how this program would would play out over the next four months and um, and hopefully get your 
okay tomorrow at the head of, because this is not a, a meeting where where action is taken. So tomorrow's meeting is hopefully get your okay tomorrow to keep on moving. Um, as I think I said to some of you commissioners, this there's no. Um, uh, you know, this is this is not a these are not perfect documents at this point, and I think we'll have an opportunity to to uh, to evolve with this program as we go. You know, they're, they're going to have I think at this point at least two rounds. Lancaster County did two rounds of funding. It's not first come first serve, so anybody who didn't make the first round gets a chance to to apply in the second round. But that also gives us a chance to to learn a little bit about what went well in the first round and what we might want to change for the second round. Um, so what you have before you is our very good uh, efforts, um, but if there are changes to be made here and there, whether that be by your suggestion or by uh, this panel in front of you, there's, you know, that, that may be necessary. And that's fine. So um, I guess in general, before we delve in, do commissioners, do you have any, any um, general questions about about what you've seen so far? Uh, just a, a general observation about the application. The um, area, not that we need to get into the weeds yet, but I, just the one that I was wondering about was where it, it asks you to please check all that apply, um, and, you know, asking for whether they're African American, Hispanic, or Asian American. Is that a, you know, a, I say I'm not familiar with these things. Is that typical or is that required or how, how did we get that part in there? Um, I, I have, I had the same question. It's, it's not a requirement. Um, it is, I think, typical of a lot of funding that comes through the federal government and, and passed on down so that it, in the event there's, you know, an inquiry or a, or reporting that requires identifying minority owned businesses, um, veteran owned businesses, et cetera, that we have that data, that we don't have to go back and chase after it or try to, you know, try to recoup it later. Uh, it's check all that apply. If none of them apply, so be it. It's also optional. I think I'd, I really like the overall content. Um, I think you've hit a lot of things that I had questions about. For example, the final report uh, is due, things like that are, are, are good for accountability. Um, just in Commissioner Phillips' question, if there is a possibility to, uh, for instance, either number one, two, three, four, five, or A, B, C, D, E, um, I see when you get to the applicant certifies that there are numbers, but on the application itself. So if I'm talking with you, I could say go to number on page one, if that makes any sense. Because otherwise, it took me a little bit of time to figure out what he was talking about. Um, so maybe section in the application, like applicant information is section one, section two, section three. And that might even well, make And then under that, then, you know, each uh, area would have a one, two, three, or ABC as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it may make it easier too when people have questions they can. That we can um, communicate better. Mm -hmm. Can can we return to the question about the where they're expected to uh, check all that apply in sure. relationship to race and so on? Where did we come up with that idea? Is that something that was suggested suggested by the federal or state government? No, I think. Go ahead, if anybody wants to chime something in. That, can I address this for a moment? Is that all right to jump in? Sure. Okay, so um, I can address that that originally came from the um, application that Lancaster County put out for their CARES funding. So we began by using that as a template and then adjusted it for us. However, in our research in trying to understand industries that were most heavily hit, um, by the pandemic shutdowns, 45% uh, of minority and women-owned businesses were harder hit, or, or women and my minority-owned businesses were 45% hit harder. And so we do have a small weighted portion in the business and tourism rubric that allows for a little extra point value if one of those two values is checked. 
The rest of it is really just to try to capture data should anybody want to find out um, if there was a preference or if there, you know, who was actually applying for later on down the road. It is not a necessity to keep that in, but that's where it came from. Okay. I know with my state loans, we do not ask that question. But I, and I, anytime you do a federal application, a lot of times they're in the federal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I think that was part of, part of the, the reasoning is that this all is, a, is all federal money. And as DCED keeps on coming out with guidance, they are often referring just back to the CARES Act. You know, this, this, uh, in fact, but it's not a requirement of the CARES Act, as far as we know. As far as we know. But I, I'm not an expert on the CARES Act. Big dot. Um, so other, one other thing I want to point out on the, you can see that the question, I mean, essentially the questions that are being asked, uh, most of the questions on the application tie to the rubric. So the idea is that this application, for the most part, uh, the, depending on what's filled in, will contribute greatly to the scoring. So there isn't a lot of subjectiveness to the scoring that it will, you know, if this, then the, then the applicant falls into this or gets a certain number of points on their, on their score automatically because of the answers given. On the third page, I want to point out that the certification, Commissioner Litz referred to the certification and those are eight items on there. Uh, these, again, were largely brought over from Lancaster County's application. However, there is some language that is in, uh, for example, item number two, that is uh, in accordance with the settlement agreement we have with the, with the uh, governor's office. So we you know that there was a, a paragraph in that settlement agreement that says that applicants must all fully comply with, and, and some of this language was also in Lancaster's, but we specified it so that it, it mirrors the language of the agreement, but that all uh, applicants have fully complied with all federal, state, and local laws, regulations, and orders applicable to this grant, um, et cetera. So you'll, you can read through that, but it's basically just a compliance uh, that mirrors the language that we have in our, in our settlement agreement. I do have one question. I understand that there is a link that you run either their EIN through or something to see if there's any outstanding whatever. Um, they didn't file a final paper on a previous grant or they didn't pay taxes or something like that. Would it be us to give them that link on this application so that they can check themselves and not waste your time applying if they indeed have things that are out of compliance? Does anybody else have experience with, with that sort of thing with, for applicants? I mean, some of you, I mean, three, I think. When I submit an application to the state, uh, they, we also fill out a form for the Department of Revenue, and that uh, looks into, to see if they have any back taxes uh, due. Um, I don't know, are we concerned at this point if these companies are struggling um, I think some of them had waivers for taxes. Are we, are we going to be concerned if they have back taxes due? Because if we are, then we could add that to it. But if we're not. If, if they have previous year taxes due, which is outside of COVID-19, then I would think that that would not make them eligible, but that's just me. I don't know if we have any restriction on the status of the, bu the business and their taxes. I think that would be, if that is something that you want as a determination, that we need to state it in the requirements uh, as a clear indication, in which case then that EIN number becomes pretty critical. Yeah, it could be inserted somewhere in there that would be part of the certification. Now, I'm not sure about being able to filter every application and you know, run it through a run it through a filter, but they would be certifying so that if anything ever came back and, and they weren't, then it would be on the responsibility of the applicant. Are there any other wishes of, in, in that direction, in that regard? 
for to add to that add that to the sort to the certification of the applicants. Yes, I'm wondering is that you know how how important is that to us? How uh, if we check and I guess I'm trying not to make this too cumbersome um, a document to get through. We're trying to help people and uh, not look for ways not to help them. Uh, so I'm just trying to balance that out. And you guys have invested all the time in it, so I'm I'm bowing to your uh, judgment on this stuff. Um, you know more so than if we had created it. But I so I I'm sort of gonna if you feel way it is 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 the way it should be then uh, in, you know, that's why I'm not fighting you on the uh, it bothers me that we have asked people to check out their boxes of their their minority status but I, I'm not going to fight it I'm just from wrong generation I think that's, you know uh, no it bothers me as well I, I don't think it should have any bearing on this whatsoever and and I I see no reason why it should be weighted if uh, certainly they should be able, no matter what their, their nationality or their background, their race, they should be able to make the case as to whether or not they were hard or hit. I don't think we should be handing out money based on uh, a supposition or even a study that was done that says African American and women owned businesses suffered great more, more so than someone else. Uh, and I, certainly I don't see the going into e detail the Hispanic business, you know, that uh, I, I, I don't know. It's, that's always been a, a pet peeve of mine when uh, contracts are handed out and so on that people get additional points because they're, they happen to be of a certain race or uh, a gender or whatever. So. I would rather not see that in there myself, but obviously I've... I don't think there's any repercussion to take it out. And, you know, I don't know that, um, I don't see a reason we couldn't take it out. It's not required, it's your program. I just want to make sure we're complying with federal laws and we cannot discriminate, so... Well, that that is discrimination right there, so... If you want to not discriminate, then you need to take it out. Do we have any other input from Brooke or Karen? Or no, I, I I hear everybody's point of view. I, I think from from the perspective of the group, I know in our discussions we talked about having the information available if you're challenged as commissioners or as the county about the funds that have been dispersed, that you would have that information. So if it's not weighted it might be valuable information to collect if you're willing to do that. So you also are able to respond and say, here is how we distributed it. So you can show that there was an equitable process. That, that's the only thing I would say on it. I, I guess I'm lost. Uh, how would that show it's an equitable process if it's a uh, 50% white owned business and the Caucasian yeah. owned businesses? And I, I don't know, I, it's complicated for me to understand the value or the it's just an imp impediment to fairness. I, you know, I don't know. I just, I, again, I'm in the wrong, wrong generation, so I don't want to get you guys know better about this stuff than I do. So I think if, you know, if we have 70% uh, white owned businesses and 30% and Hispanic owned, you would be able to show how the money was distributed. So if you're challenged to say none of this money went to Hispanic owned businesses, you would be able to show how it was distributed. That, that's all. And again, it's, it certainly is your program and your choice. Uh, I just feel to have the data might be useful if you need to use it at some point. And on the flip side, if you don't ask, then you can't use that. Nobody can say, well, you knew it was a Hispanic owned business and didn't give money for that reason. So I, I think there's arguments on both sides. It's easy enough to take out in the um, Business grant rubric, it is a 5% weight uh, that can easily be taken off and added into another category that needs a little more weight to it. So it's a very simple fix if that's the way you'd like to go. And, and what we're looking for is this kind of feedback so that we can hopefully bring you something tomorrow that you're ready to move forward with. So if that's... I think that's, collecting the information is perfectly in order and could also be to our advantage. I, I'm not you know, necessarily asking for waiting, but I think collecting the information is a good thing. 
Right, I'll compromise on leave it in. It's optional, but no wait. All right, then uh, other parts of the application, there are, um, there are two places where it's a narrative response. One is just uh, the first page, a brief summary of services and goods that are produced, and the second page, um, a, a current and projected future impact of COVID-19 to the operations. So um, you know, that's probably the most subjective part there. It, the, the information is going to mostly speak for itself, but uh, whoever's reviewing the application would have that that um, narrative box to be able to go to and say, you know, that maybe this sheds a little bit more light on how COVID impacted them. Because as, as those of you who've read thoroughly through this stuff, and just yesterday, as I referred earlier, DCD came out with a, a whole bunch of pages and pages of Q&A that have been presented to them over the last couple of weeks on how they see these determinations being made. And, and in almost every answer, it has to be tied somehow to an impact from COVID. Um, and that's, that's the opportunity for the applicant to say, here's, here's what happened and here's how it, you know, harmed, harmed our, our organization. So anything else on the application and, and any of the four of you, if you want to, highlight something there that we spent some time on, go right ahead. And I guess it's important to say that the scoring we intend to be, um, I don't want to get too far out of my abilities here, but to be somewhat automatic where the, the information that's filled in will populate the rubric and be given a score just simply because it's there. Is that is that an accurate way of putting who else wants to tackle that a little better? That, that, so, you know, it's not as though every piece of data that's, that's on here will be, have to be inputted and, and manipulated or handled by someone or, you know, it, it'll populate the rubric automatically through. Uh, oh, and I can kind of add in on that, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, we are uh, hoping that the application would be available online. We do have an estimate for somebody who will create a secure application process online that would mimic the printed version that you have. But as people fill in the data in each of those questions, it would automatically export it into an Excel spreadsheet. That spreadsheet would assign values based on certain questions and according to the rubric. Um, so we would have 80% of the score automatically calculated based on the rubric. The other 20% um, comes from the proposed review committee reading through the narrative and giving an additional 20% value based on the narrative. So we're trying to figure out if there's a way, you know, if you have 300 applications and only the top 150 will fit in the funding for that first category, then you don't have to read the narrative of every application if they're so far down in the scoring. So it's, it's just trying to automate as much as possible so that, um, there's not so much time intensive work for a review committee. Does that make sense to everyone? It takes a bit of the human element out of the scoring and automates it. Well, I have a question. Does the applicant see that rubric? Or is that just something internal? It's a good question. We addressed that yesterday. <laughs> But the rubric in a, in a modified version of it, a, a con condensed version, is in the FAQs on the last page. So there are two rubrics. One, uh, you know, as we went through, how do we just determine the true story behind any of these organizations, nonprofits, restaurants, or businesses? How do we really determine their true need? So we debated the rubric an awful lot to make sure that that would tell the story as accurately as possible. And in going through that, it was very clear, and Brooke, I don't want to speak for you, I'm sure you, want, you might want to jump in, um, but it was very clear that the nonprofit story would be told very differently than small business or tourism. So nonprofit yes. has its, I'm sorry, Commissioner. 
I, I, I'm just confused. When you say the last page, are you on page three? Or are you talking about the little graph and that page isn't numbered in sequence? It's a, it's the frequently asked questions. Uh, there's a document of frequently asked questions. Um, yeah, on the last page, it ends at question 36. And then after that is the scoring, the scoring rubric so that people can see applicants can see this is this is how you the scores will be applied. Okay, I guess in addition to ABC, those pages should also be numbered because again, communication is hard for me because I don't know what you're looking at. Does Absolutely. that make sense? Um, I go through this with our stockbrokers and people like that, they come in and they're talking, I have no idea where they are. Um, so I said, please number your pages and give me the page number. Okay. But the very the, the very last item on that on that packet of FAQ. It's a table with percent. Sorry to interrupt, Karen. No, 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 you're fine. I, and that's you know, and that's the thing. Sometimes you're so close to the process, you forget to see some of the obvious things. So those are great suggestions. Yeah. So that would give applicants the ability to see how their how their uh, information is going to be scored the transparency to the to the scoring and that's that's a good thing mm -hmm. i like that i just want to be able to follow along and i think um numbers will help and the other thing that and i think i some of you may be aware of this and some not but i think to be an official document it should have the county seal somewhere on it Would you like that on the FAQs and, and as well, because that will go out publicly? If you have a, a good space to put it, sure. Um, I just think that uh, it takes some pressure off of you and it gives a, a, you know, official, an official look to the document. Mm -hmm. we, we were hoping to tie it together with the Forward Together Lebanon the campaign that, that um, that EDC had started on and that Barb Kaufman has done some some uh, some work on so far uh, just as a I guess a, a branding or an ID that it, that it can be referred to you know it doesn't mean that, that doesn't mean it takes the place of the county seal but just to be able to tie these things all together that that if you're talking about COVID relief or CARES relief in Lebanon County it's that program and other counties have have identified you know uh, a title or a, or a name to their program. So that could yeah. be, that could, it could be both really on the application. The county yeah. field and, and and application. Even, even the colors, if you could just do it in black and white, I, I'm not real fond of the colors. Um, that's not the county colors for sure. <laughs> so if they could just be black and white, that would be fine. Even the forward together Lebanon? Yeah, there was like green and orange, or it's, I don't know if it's yellow or orange, but it's not um, identified as a county. Um, it doesn't look like the county. We don't put anything out in those colors. So if it could just be black and white, that would be fine. That way it, it wouldn't have a, another feel to it. There'd be con consistency with the county identification. I think the question would come up then if for the online application that we are uh, we are we have presumed that we will drive people to the economic recovery plan website forward together Lebanon that would then link them to the application so on that application page we we were thinking but certainly it's changeable that it would be branded as if they were still working with the Forward Together Lebanon program, even though it's county money, um, we're just trying to brand it through that economic recovery plan as this is a, um, uh, something that kind of ties into the idea of economic recovery for the county. Uh, because it is, it needs to be a secure page, it's not part of the Forward Together Lebanon website. At least this is obviously just what we have presumed we, we don't know for sure what you will recommend, but um, we, it would have its, it could be called Lebanon County Cares Grants.com. It could be whatever you want it to be, but it would just be a single page on the website that captures the application data. 
However you decide you want that branded is entirely up to you. Originally, we had thought it would be branded under Forward Together Lebanon. And I think that that website is already a place that we've been trying to drive businesses and nonprofits and community members. Um, if you haven't seen the website, Commissioner Litz, we'd be happy to share it with you. But um, businesses are already looking there for some information and resources. So it seemed like a really good fit to be able to align this application as another resource for the business and nonprofit communities. Well, I guess there is a little bit of, um, and, and I'm saying this because I, I, everybody has to be on the same page. Um, I'm concerned, wait, 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 wait. excuse me? Nothing. I'm concerned if we have if we are drawing businesses to it and putting it out publicly, that we are following all of the laws ourselves. And so, you know, do you have a fictitious name file? Do you have uh, proper liability insurance? And there are all those kinds of things that go along with something like this. And um, I, I'm just concerned with the county being branded with something if it's not completely in compliance with what we're asking them to do is comply with the law. Does that make sense? Not really. We had discussed we had discussed that yesterday in the meeting with Jamie, if you know, with the liability with Forward Together Lebanon, and you know what, Jamie, you thought it was just you know that's well, yeah, you didn't program, see a liability the with program. It. I mean, this whole program is is a is a county county run uh, program. Keep using that word, but you know, the doling, the the, the 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 doling out or the granting of this money, the process as we sit here today and hopefully tomorrow, everything is being endorsed by the county. So it's under the direction and control of the county. So with that, um, there shouldn't there there wouldn't be any extension of liability to to others. Ultimately, it's up to the I mean that the grant is the county's, and this is this is why I said from the very start of this and everybody here in this panel uh, will re remember me saying this often enough that everything to do with this must go before the commissioners because the commissioners are the grantee uh, of the funds, the recipient of the funds and, and the responsibility and liability all goes back to the county. So anything affiliated with this would, would apply in that way. And I hear what you're saying. Um, but still, if we're using a tool, uh, going through a, a, another organization, because I thought we were dealing with the Chamber and the United Way and EDC and the Tourist Bureau, but if we bring in this Forward Lebanon Valley, are they in compliance when it comes to um, fictitious names and all those sorts of things? Or, or Do they file a tax return? Do they have employees? I mean, I don't know that because I was on the website. There's no identification who Forward Lebanon Valley is that I could find. Forward together. And no contact information. It, 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 it started with the EDC. It's a, it's a web presence, basically. It's nothing more than that. I mean, there's, you know, there's, a, there's a working uh, group leaders, which, uh, Susan, you want to you know, just refer to the people you've been working with, and part of it was developing that website, but there isn't, there isn't anything that that group. There's no. There's no money. There's no responsibility. There are no employees. It's. It's just a presence on the web. Susan, can you just briefly go through who the, who you're working with on a? On a yeah, record? on the uh, Forward Together Lebanon, it would be Karen Grow, Brooke Smith, uh, Jeffrey Roach, uh, Jennifer Easter, um, Bob Dowd. Um, Julie Basante from Elko, um, Barb Kaufman with Kaufman Creative Services. Uh, I think I, there was, was that eight? Did I get you all? And yeah, they're, so they're all, they're all great people. I'm just talking about the entity itself. So right. So we don't get into trouble. Right, oh, John, right. I brought that up yesterday because I, you know, I had a little bit of concern about it as well, that, you know, is there liability to forward together Lebanon does yes. it come back to the EDC? Is, it, is there any liability that could come back to the EDC using the Forward Together Lebanon? Because like Jamie said, it's a, a web presence. It's all us business leaders working together as a team. We did not file a fictitious name. Uh, it's not, doesn't have its own entity. It's just 
um, what we use. So yeah, I, I mean, no EIN number, none of that. There, no, there isn't, there isn't any money. There isn't any. I, I don't know where the liability would stem from. All right, Bill. Let's let's do this. Bill, where are you with this uh, so far? Well, <laughs> I think we should have our I'm, attorney review it. Oh no! God. I want to hear where Bill is first, and then we'll. Well, talk. well, I'm I'm dizzied by this discussion because I think it's a lot of time sidetracked. I you know I don't think it, you know. You can put a disclaimer on the website and say, you know, this is not a an organization. This is just, uh, you know, a name that we've given to the county program for the disbursement of the CARES money or something. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't really exist uh, as I see it. So, uh, that, you know, there's no like we said, there's no money. Nobody's getting a salary. Nobody's getting any money from it. Uh, I, I, I guess it's everything and people will question it. So I'm good with that. If our attorney clears it, yes, okay. I'm, I'm good. All right. If the attorney um, clears it, I'm good. All right. Okay. Then um, let, let's go. Anything else on the application? I'm not trying to stop the discussion on that, but I'm just, I just want to, I wanted to hear if, if, if Bill was, you know, if you take the weight out of that uh, optional, Park Bill, are you better with that, or for the sake of moving forward, Bob? I, I'm I'm still not happy with it, but then you know, like I said, I've been unhappy with that question for a hundred years. I'm like you; we're old guys. Well, you're not as old as me. But. We're getting close. All right. <laughs> so, anything else with the app? Well, did you clarify what you want to do with the uh, taxes? Did you want Did you want to include that in, or or leave it out? No. I don't think that's necessary. Okay. Okay. I agree. If I may interject for a moment on the um, entity of Forward uh, Together Lebanon, um, Lancaster County, who, uh, EDC and Chamber received $33 million of the CARES Act funds to work on their uh, Recovery Lancaster program. Um, their website does not indicate anybody who is in one, in like one particular point of contact. Uh, they show the two entities of the chamber and the EDC and the county working together on that recovery plan and they show um, additional partner organizations in the county. Additionally, uh, Lancaster has stated that um, they did not set their recovery Lancaster up as any entity um, because the, the, that ultimately the county had the, the um, funding and dollars and um, that they did not see that there would be any liability issue on their part. So, Lancaster County, then, I'm sorry. Are any of them attorneys? No, but I, I would think that, um, that I, I can check and see if Lancaster County went. I mean, I think it's everything still needs to go through an attorney anyway. Yes, yeah, so uh, We do have statements in the application that release the Chamber, the EDC, the United Way, Visit Lebanon Valley, um, and our boards from liability in regards to this. So maybe that wording is something that really needs to be carefully looked at. Um, but in terms of setting up forward together Lebanon as an, as an entity with, um, with bylaws and everything else, I, I feel that uh, in looking at the Lancaster side of things where they have a much greater stake in it uh, with money, um, if they didn't do that, not that we should assume that we don't have to, but I think that we may not need to. It's essentially a project name, am I correct? It's yeah. a project name, right? It's an effort, yeah. Okay, then um, let's, let's move on, if we could, to the frequently asked questions. And um, I'll turn that over to the rest of you. I think Karen, you you first. Uh, this is sort of your your product. You're the one making changes whenever we talk about it and and keep it on your machine. And so on. There are, there are a few things in there that we still need to get answers to, and we'll see where there are either zeros or X's that there's a, either a date that has not been filled in yet, or a or a, um, a telephone number or a contact and. And I want to remember that before we finish up the discussion on that part of it is um, is to discuss a, a schedule of uh, 
you know, available windows of application and so on from between now and the end of the year. So I'll turn it over to the four of you guys for the FAQ. If you want to walk through them, fine. If the commissioners want to just have specific questions. But Karen, you want to talk about how much of this maybe is Lancaster's, how much of it we've worked on here? Um, some of the, the skeleton portion of it was Lancaster's, but we really found that Lancaster's FAQs and process were based on the situation when they released informa uh, information and money, which was way back in April and May. So once we, you know, once we got through and we went green, it changed a lot of the information that was in here. So we have gone through on um, all of the questions and, and pieces of information to see and uh, to review them and make sure, are they relevant for today? Will they be relevant in a couple of months? And are they relevant to Lebanon County? So there have been, while it was on a skeletal basis of Lancaster, there have been many, many evolutions to make it uh, very unique to Lebanon County. And there's 35 or 36 different issues that we've attempted to address in here, but that certainly isn't going to be the end of it. Um, so hopefully we will have an opportunity or a contact for applicants to call, um, you know, to get specific questions. The county does not have a grant coordinator, so I don't really have a person to point to and say, here's your county contact on this. Um, I think is a, an unanswered question for us right now, at least it was as of yesterday's meeting. Uh, one thing that we um, that we have in here that I want to uh, bring your attention to is is potentially having questions answered that are maybe business finance related, and that that may be a small business, a mom or pop operation that. Um, you know, just doesn't, maybe doesn't know what some of these, some of this datum is that they'd, have, they'd be asking to fill in on the application. So who can we go to and who can we ask? In Lancaster County, they identified a, um, a accounting firm that, to say, here's, there's a dedicated telephone number, you call this number, that person can then, um, you know, guide you in what that information is, not necessarily guide them with any sort of, you know, uh, counting advice or anything like that. Just what does that mean, where you might find it for yourself um, and, and get the application filled in? Because any missing information in this application is gonna detrim be detrimental to their, to their chances. So um, we have had initial initial contact with uh, Garcia, and Gar Garcia, Garman, and Shea. Is that right? Am I getting that right? Uh, they do have a bilingual person there that could possibly answer the phone and, and help to direct anyone who has questions, they're central to the county. Um, you know, but that, that's an initial thought that, uh, that we could facilitate something like that. Um, I guess if we had other, other um, firms interested in that sort of thing, we could provide a, a list of, here are the firms in Lebanon County if you wanted to call. You know, that all, that all depends on whether or not a firm wants to, wants to entertain calls that aren't clients but just there to be, you know, helpful to the community and answer those questions. So, did, I, did I capture that enough? Okay. In the spirit of um, expediency, I, you know, I'm fine with picking a firm to get us started. And if others want to be involved, you know, as we get further along, uh, but want you know if we can avoid barriers to launching this thing um, that would be good um, most of the businesses will have their own accountants that'll figure some of this out for them and give them the information so I mean that's probably a majority of the applicants right. I would think it may even literally you know have them do the application for them yeah that way too yeah yeah if I may interject with just a thought about that um, we talked about it yesterday, and I think it's nice to have a, an impartial, um, neutral uh, company that would represent all of our um, interests instead of people calling us individually at 
the Chamber or United Way or Economic Development or visit Lebanon Valley. We want to make sure people understand you don't have to be a member of the Chamber. You don't have to be a member of Visit Lebanon Valley or something like that in order to uh, be given, you know, this application and have it be given a good, fair chance. So we felt it was important. And I think that's the same point behind Forward Together Lebanon. It's, it's a neutral site that is one place that people can go to for um, unbiased and uh, correct information. So that, that I think is the, the point behind what the, the whole site was developed for. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because we, it was all, all along, it was part of the FAQ in here, but yesterday we actually elevated up to the, be the first question under the category of eligibility to make it clear. Um, that question being, does the business have to be a member of Lebanon Valley Chamber, a United Way partner, or visit Lebanon Valley member? No, the grant funds are available for all businesses in Lebanon County that meet the eligibility criteria regardless of their membership status with any organization. So that was moved as a top question under eligibility, just so it's made clear. Uh, and I actually, from the commissioners, I had fielded that question from a couple of you, you know, early on to make, to make uh, clear that, it, that that wouldn't be something that people believe they had to do or be a part of. Uh, let me touch a little on the uh, on the timeline. Uh, hopefully, this isn't overly ambitious. We, you know, we're less than a week from having been uh, granted these funds, but we are we are almost two months into the process of trying to come up with the program. So, I think we're almost there. Um, we have proposed in here two phases to the. Um, to the application periods, uh, uh, and Lancaster County did the same. For example, had two rounds. They are not a first come, first serve round. They are two opportunities. So, if a, if a company or a business or an entity, nonprofit, whatever, missed the first round, they're they're welcome to apply in the second round. The first one we would hope to be kicking off uh, the open window at on September one, and have a two week period of applications to September 15. After that, a two-week period to go over the applications, uh, come up with awards and, and announce those, announce and, and deliver those awards September 30th. Then the phase two would be um, two weeks after the announce of those awards. And, and there's a two, I built two weeks into that so that we have a chance to revisit what happened in round one. Maybe something you know, we wanted to change with the application or with the process or something to make it go smoother uh, and evolve, evolve the program a little bit. So there's a, there's a little bit of time in there to kind of check ourselves and, and see if there's anything that needs to be changed. But October 15th then would be the last grant or the, the second round of grant applications that would go to October 30th and then grant awards on November 15th. After that, the CARES Act provide and Act 24 provide for a period of, I've been calling it kind of a gut check, but it's a, it's a period where all of the recipients, meaning counties, must submit a report saying, here's what was spent in all categories, here's what is unspent or unencumbered, and then the state puts that all together, and by the same formula in Act 24 that they, that they uh, broke out the original funding, they would break out what's left over and deliver out to those counties. What's not clear to me is how much time is then available for that funding to be used. Because if, if we're submitting a sort of a final report in the end of November and they're letting us know, okay, based on all of the counties and the money they've spent or not spent, you have a new allocation of X. How do we spend that before December 30? It literally gives you, you know, just another few weeks to, to get it out there. I know that there is legislation that's already been introduced at the federal level. level. Uh, I think uh, it, was, it was a senator from Iowa and a senator from New Hampshire, a uh, bipartisan bill that was introduced to extend the CARES deadline through 2021. So that would give everyone an extra year, literally, to, um, to be able to spend down these funds and assist businesses and entities 
Um, I know that in the County Commissioner Association, um, doing it the right way. And, and, and I don't have a freaking clue. Uh, you know, I have the, the guidelines. I mean, I can look at. Uh, um, so that would assist us, but I know that in, this, in the County Commissioner Association uh, meetings that I've been part of or calls that I've been part of and others have, other counties have been asking for an extension already. They're already having trouble, you know, either coming up with their program or they're finding it to be too compressed to, uh, to deliver all the funding out there and are, and are asking for an extension. But of course, the answer we got is that is not a state decision. That is a federal decision because this is these this timeline has been established under the federal act. So I'm sure the pressure will will only come you know come November December or something to to consider that extension. But uh, that I think be driving that is the broadband for the rural areas so they can get schooling to the kids. Yeah, and broadband installations you, you can't just do them in a matter of a couple months. Yeah. Right? There's a whole process to engineering and installation and maybe even another year isn't enough in some cases if you're taking broadband out into the rural areas uh, that's that's a literal literally a, a utility construction mm -hmm. um, so that's the timeline proposed um, you know that's about two weeks from now for the first uh, less than two weeks from now for the for the opening of the of that application And then as far as the uh, decisions on the awards of these grants, um, as I said before, ultimately though every dollar that is spent from these care funds must go through your meeting and go before you and be approved by you on a majority vote. That, that's we're the recipient of the grant, that's the way it needs to be. The county is gonna be responsible and, and accountable for this. Uh, there will be an audit for it, and we will be subject to audit by the U.S. Treasury. So everything has to go before you. Um, however, as in other counties and other programs, they have uh, appointed panels to review these applications and then assemble recommended uh, lists of award of, a, of, of recipients and present to you to approve. You have the ability to just simply you know, say, yes, I see this list. I trust the rubric. Uh, we appointed the committee. I trust the committee. And therefore, we're going to approve all of these. Or I need more information and want to look, you know, I'd like to be, you know, lay my eyes on this or that application and see a little more information. We don't know how many applications we're going to get. Um, Karen, could you touch on or uh, the numbers in Lancaster County, if you remember off the top of your head, how many as a percentage they they received and how that would translate into numbers in Lebanon County? So in their first round, about 20% of the businesses in Lancaster County applied, but not all were eligible. So um, if we use that same idea, we roughly estimated that in our first round, if we choose to go that way, if you choose, that we might have about 200 applications in round one. The only difference is that Lancaster County limited their first round of applications to, um, to employers with one to 20 employees. In their second round of applications that they opened it up to everybody up to um, 99 employees, they had a far greater turnout in applications. Um, I'd have to dig a little to find that number. But ultimately, I think we were estimating between two and 300 applications based on the ratio of Lancaster counties. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that Lancaster County's application process opened while our state was still in yellow and businesses had not had the opportunity to apply for many other grant opportunities that have since come out. So the state business assistance program um, and a whole bunch of other ones have since been out. I do think that many of our businesses' needs may have been met to some degree through other programs. So it's kind of a hit and miss, but we did look at it based on percentages and ratios. The other thing to, that I think is kind of in our favor in that is that I, I just found out today that Schuylkill County's application process is only just open 
and their first round of applications will close on September 2nd. So while we, we may have a, you know, kind of this mark against us for being delayed so much, the potential for us to catch up by expediting this process if we come to that agreement is going to look really good for us in that we haven't lost the time that others may have by not, by waiting. You know, I think that's what we all thought about as we got together on a weekly basis, whether we get the money or not, let's be ready to go if we get it. So we have worked really hard to try to get it as close as possible to what we felt might work. Um, and then obviously upon your review and your revisions as well. Thank you for that hard work. May I just ask you? You unmute. How that happened, I did that to myself, I guess. Um, this related to, to those comments, this might be a good opportunity, Susan, I'm going to go to you because uh, there, there is a, you know, one of the categories that the, that the CARES Act provided for was for an economic development component and potentially for some of the larger manufacturing businesses to seek some help. But um, what I've learned from Susan is that, that those manufacturers have been, for the most part, able to stay open. Um, they have received a lot of PPP help and in your you know in your circulation and and, the, and and in your discussions with them or or maybe not too much not much interest you're, you're not getting a lot of people clamoring for help from that sector of, of employer is that fair yeah not from the larger companies there's a few smaller manufacturers that are looking um but when I spoke with the government policy manager yesterday, he said this program isn't for larger businesses. So anything over a hundred, unless they're actually producing something because of COVID, he said he would steer away from um, the companies over a hundred. So I don't know whether or not we want to, um, I guess that's something we, we didn't really talk to the, to our working group here, we didn't really determine whether those phases or those rounds would be, uh, you know, a one to 20 or a one to 100, but um, that's something we can either hash out here or, or make a recommendation to the commissioners at some point, like Lancaster did. I didn't understand the question. One to 20, what? One to 20 employees, businesses that, it, the, the small business, the very small businesses that, that have a, uh, that employ one to 20 employees. That, oh, that's, of employees. Yeah, that's what Lancaster opened up to only those in their first round. And then they opened the second round was one to a hundred. So they expanded it. Karen said that that second round was by far the, the bigger round because of the, the bigger employers. So if you wanted to break it up like that and, and give the, you know, the smaller is the first opportunity. Well, I'm, I'm just afraid that some of the ones maybe with a little bit more than 20, all of them, I'm afraid, are going to go under. Um, I think that the money they all need it now. So if we yeah, that's my inclination it, also. Yeah, yeah, if we can process them now, I'd rather do that. Fire companies, a lot of them are really struggling. Yeah, well, nonprofits would be different. I don't think they stay. They didn't stage nonprofits. I don't think in, in Lancaster just by employees for employees. Oh, I see. Yeah. But yeah, still, they need the money yeah. now. Yeah. Okay. No, oh, I would agree with the broader category right away. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the only thing I want to add before um, you know get too far away from it is the uh, where the applicant certifies, you know, signs off on you know all that they've read and are complied with. Two seems a little thin to me um, based on our you know uh, uh, the the agreement that we have for this money that we you know we're you know just got approved for last week that seems like there should be more meat in there that says that they have complied with all phases of you, you cut a word there was a word or two that cut out there bob you said where you thought something number was uh, number, two, number two number two number two seems light to me okay a well, I, I i will tell you that our i did hand it this language is what we've come up with but i did hand it off to our solicitor to look at that to see if it's going to fit the bill so um, all right. you That's think it needs a little 
more teeth there to get the message across, you know, that's I do. not hard to do. But, but I, cause I also know at the end of this thing that we do not want to be, we want to spend every penny that we can responsibly, but we don't want to have to give any back uh, after the audit because we didn't have enough uh, guidance in the, in the certification. Part. Okay. okay. Thank yeah, you. and we we're, we have to go after the businesses. That puts us in an awkward cate category. Um, the, the state comes after us. We have to go after the businesses. And that's one of the reasons I don't know if taxes, back taxes outside of this year would be a, a concern with the state. And giving them money if they owe taxes, in other words. I'm not conceding that I would go after businesses for the money that we gave to them under the circumstances if they followed our guidelines. I'm not going to go there yet. Uh, that would be another discussion. Um, but, but I certainly don't want the county to, it's all, all this is taxpayer money in one fashion or another. But I, I just want to make sure we give the best shot at, as we can of being compliant with, you know, the agreement that we have. And, and uh, on that, Commissioner Litz, on that issue about back taxes and so on, I did not get through all of the DCED Q&A that they provided. I think it's close to 100 FAQ that they that they answered they'd spent the last couple of weeks on. So, and that just came in last evening. So I didn't get a chance to look through that. Maybe that question's answered in there, or if not, maybe it's something we can pose directly to DCED for some clarification. That would be great. I, like I said, I'm just trying to protect the citizens, the taxpayers, so that we don't get uh, end up having to cover that if the state wants the money back because they owe taxes somewhere else in the state, sales tax or whatever. Okay. What else you got? Um, Brooke, Jen, Karen, Susan, anything, anything more that I'd missed there before we? I don't think so. Maybe just one thing I wanted to point out that you'll notice is different in the nonprofit scoring rubric. We wanted a way to differentiate life sustaining nonprofits or those that are providing a human service versus uh, like your soccer clubs or PTAs and things like that. So you will notice that that question is weighted heavier for organizations that are providing a human service, such as those that have been operating the full time during the closures that are providing food, shelter, domestic violence support, uh, health clinics, those types of things. We wanted to make sure that those were weighted a little bit heavier in the scoring rubric. So that's just something I wanted to point out. Do you take mental health into consideration because some of the organizations are providing things for people to do sure. and uh, supplementing governmental programs? Yeah, for sure. So, so anybody that would have been deemed life-sustaining as a nonprofit during that time. And we had actually asked everybody, I believe that's a question, Karen, correct me if I'm wrong. It's on the application for everyone to answer, but it's only weighted in the nonprofit section. I might uh, bring up, you know, Commissioner Litz keeps referring to back taxes and so on. And, and then we've already said, well, maybe we'd have to, uh, you know, collect the money or whatever. Uh, maybe a question in the application, are you, are you current with all state and federal uh, taxes and fees or something like that? And it, that way they would at least be attesting to it when they sign the application. I would welcome that. I think that's a good idea. So does that mean that that would make them ineligible if they were not? And if so, that we should add that to the ineligibility details? I don't know that it would make them uh, ineligible right off the bat. I think if you, you know, listen to their uh, explanation and um, if they're willing to rectify it, um, then they could move forward. And they may have they may have already reached an agreement or something with the state or someone. I mean, those things are done, you know. So, yeah, and and related to that, Commissioner Ames, uh, that may be the case, but they'll they'll have to know that they can't use this funding to settle those to pay those taxes. Pay, right? Yeah, because it's clear on legal settlement, this money can't be used toward you know, settling of legal legal obligations. 
Is that something that, um, I guess on the tax question, is that something that you feel strongly about as commissioners or are you worried about it being a regulation with giving the money out? And if so, I think we should try to figure out if that's something that's a stipulation through the CARES Act or if it's just a personal county preference that you would like to follow that. I have not seen that as a question on other applications from Cumberland County, Schuylkill, or, um, or Lancaster. And uh, so I think, I think it, you know, we need to determine whether that's something that is just personally important to the county or something that's mandated. Well, we want to help people survive, but we also want to help people who have been responsible with their taxes to survive. I mean, that's how we pay our bills. That's how the state pays our bills. That's how this money is coming into Lebanon County. If they're not paying their taxes, they're not contributing their fair share. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I guess to be technical about the rubric, should it have weight then? You know, is that something that should be given weight in the scoring when it comes automated? I, I think it's, uh, oh, go ahead, Bill. No, well, I'm thinking more that it's, they are certifying that they're right. current with their taxes. Not that we should use it in evaluating that, you know, it probably will deter some of them from applying and then that eliminates the problem. I don't know. Perhaps that should be in the applicant certifies that in the back. Um, Again, not to keep referring to Lancaster, obviously they were the first one out of the gate as they had their money so much earlier than everybody else, which is where when we started the process, we used them for such guidance because they were the most accessible. Um, they did say that they, they had a hefty um, attorney fee working with the county to make sure that this application, um, which a lot of the, the part on the applicant certifies that. So they're, they're, uh, when I say they, I'm talking about the chamber and the EDC um, had a hefty process with their appointed attorney on making sure that this information in the application, this part that says we certify that, um, followed as much as, as they needed it to. So we did uh, mock hours after that with a couple of minor modifications and the, um, the addition of adding uh, on number two, that this includes following all emergency orders and operational restrictions under the governor's reopening plan. Um, just, to, just to kind of add that there was a little bit more oversight on that than just us coming up with it. Again, it's a, personally, it's obviously up to you guys as to what you would, um, you know, what is important to you and uh, in their um, responsibility as a business and, and their tax paying. So is your, your concern that perhaps that's a question we shouldn't ask, Karen? Is that um, from a legal standpoint? No, no, no. I think oh, we have okay. to decide why we are asking it. Are we asking it because you feel it is necessary to follow the CARES grant, grant funding allocations? Or are you asking because as county commissioners, you want to make sure that you are only giving this money out to those who are current in their tax payments? I think that's the delineation that I'm looking for, the differentiation. I, I think it's the latter myself. I think that's, you know, if they're in good standing as mm -hmm. a, as in, in Lebanon County, that's, that's kind of um, what I think we're, we're trying to get to. I don't. All right, let's do a little more, more digging on that, see if we can find it. Because if it's, just, a, if, if, it's a, uh, if it's part of the CARES Act or if it's part of the you know, the stipulations, then, then it's a moot question, then right. it's weighted, you know, okay. or it's fatal. I'm just looking, I yeah, I'm just looking at a few things uh, with Lancaster with the certification and acknowledgement of the CARES Act funds, and I'll email this over to everybody. But uh, I'm just wondering if some of this information would be in the, you're going to execute a grant uh, with each company that applies, correct? An agreement, uh, an agreement yeah. An agreement. Because in this, in their agreement, you know, it's the, uh, I'll send it over, but on there, there's one thing we may have missed, the non-description uh, sexual harassment clause that's usually in the federal, state, and local. Um, and then they're asking for a W-9 and some other things. So I don't know if you could kind of cover yourself under that exec, uh, grant, um, 
when you execute the grant, some of that terminology in there. Okay. Gotcha. And probably reiterating some of the stuff that was, that's in the fine print of the application. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, they probably should get an I-9. Uh, they would have to fill one of those out. Isn't it an I-9 or is it a W-9? W-9. W-9. An I-9 is to make sure they're, um, uh, what, citizen? Uh, W-9 is yeah. your W-9, yeah. We do tell them, I believe, on the application that they need to provide, that they will need to provide a W-9 if they are in receipt of the funds. Yes. Um, one other thing I'd like to mention, one or two here, is that it's, you know some of these applicants, because we have these different categories, and I'm specifically referring to tourism and business, some of these are going to overlap and fit into two categories. A lot of, I'm sure eateries and restaurants are probably the, big, the best example of that, where they are uh, dependent upon a lot of seasonal or, uh, you know, festivals, things like that for their, for their business. They have better times of the year than others, but they're also a business that's open all year. So we're going to have to maybe just decide which pot of money that comes out of. And since it's a block grant, Maybe, you know, in round two, slide some money from one to the other, depending on what the demand is. Uh, is that fair, Jen? Yes. Um, Karen and I have talked about it. And, you know, we really don't know how to plan for this until we see actually the, everything that comes in. And, um, you know, the bottom line is we need to get the money out to the businesses that need it. And you know, if I have extra in my pot and she doesn't, and there's more restaurants applying as small businesses instead of under tourism, you know, we're going to bottom line make make things happen the way they should. And, uh, you know, we're not sticking to those guidelines as far as money goes um, to the nth degree if there's some gray matter in the, in the middle. Like you said, we'll use the money um, and, and not waste it, get it in the right hands. And the second thing I wanted to mention related to, to tourism uh, is that this, this uh, act specifically uh, describes tourism related businesses and county fair. So I'm finding that other counties are granting money directly to their county fair or to their DMO uh, you know, and tourism entities, and that's going to have to be treated differently. And maybe it'll be important to identify those sooner than later so that we know what, what the remainder of the pot of money is. If you decide you're going to do, I'll just refer to them maybe as super grants or, you know, larger than, than typical grants. I would put the expo in that category as well. Yeah, expo, Absolutely. fair. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think we've seen that some counties have already done that. That's the golden buzzer. What's that, the buzzer? On Dancing with the Stars, you get a golden buzzer and you go through. Ah, okay. You're right, Joellen, you're right. <laughs> Thank you, you know what I'm talking about, Jen. <laughs> Fortunately, I do too. <laughs> oh, yay! <laughs> some, other, some other fans, okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's gonna be probably a few entities that we're gonna have to identify right from the start and say, those are gonna be outliers, those are gonna have to be treated separately, the act does so. And I think the commissioners also want to do so that way. I've heard that from you all. Uh, and if I can add in a couple of things, we do, so going back to kind of the allocations allowed for each business, um, we utilize the, um, the allocation divisions based on the Pennsylvania State Small Business Assistance Grant. So we thought they've already thought it through, we're going to use that. And so that's the, the part of the um, frequently asked questions that says if your income is, if your annual business revenue is up to fifty thousand, your grant can be five thousand dollars. If your annual business revenue is fifty thousand to seventy-five thousand, you can go up to ten thousand. So those levels came from the state's guidance, um, but we also have on the application the ability to check a box if they are requesting a higher amount than what is 
in that allocation that they want us to look through their their reasoning and their logic to see that there is a greater need than um, than what is allocated based on their income. So there is that exception to uh, there's no guarantee on it though. So it clearly That's states good. that there's no no guarantee for doing that. Uh, but it allows for some of those that we might not be thinking of as those super grants for them to be able to say, look, this is the reason why I've had to do this much more that takes me out of that grant allocation. Um, and the other thing, Jamie, I, don't, I hope I'm not talking out of line on this, but the other thing is that we have all decided as well that we're, we're kind of guessing how much each cluster of businesses might be applying for. But we are all in agreement that if the applications come in and there is a much heavier need in tourism or nonprofits than what is allocated and less of a need in, in small business, that with your approval, we would reallocate funds to help cover where the greatest need was based on applications as opposed to shortchanging um, one category over another just because that's how it was originally designed to be. Does that make do, sense? Do we have that authority or do we have to get that approved by the state? Because that's part of our signed agreement, those yeah, amounts. I, I think that would need to be, yeah. Approved. I think that we're gonna have to consult on that one just to make yeah. sure, but it is a block grant and the process from the, from the beginning of the, uh, the guidance, you know, the guidance from DCED was that that was gonna be easy for a county to do. You just have to notify or, or keep you know, DCED has to be made aware that those changes, those, those uh, reallocations are being made. But in our circumstance, I, I should probably check a little. Yeah, yeah and ask for an amendment, amendment, amendment that you're going to make an amendment. Oh, Darth Vader. <laughs> yeah, really well, and I think it's easy enough in tourism and small business to be able to reallocate, you know, if it's a restaurant applying under tourism, but there's still more money in small business, we just chip them over to that other category. So there's nothing that has to really be changed around. It's primarily really the nonprofit groups. I think internally, if they've applied under tourism, but they still fit the category of small business, we can juggle those things around without any question. It's, it's definitely the nonprofit category that might, might need to be reallocated a little differently based on need. I don't know what Susan said, did, and she went away from her desk. I was gonna ask her to repeat it. Because I didn't understand it. Did everybody she else? She said she had to go to the bathroom. Oh, is that what she said? No, no she, said, oh. she said it might have to be done by amendment. Oh, uh, okay. What you were referring to, the shifting around. It might have to be done. Right. By I couldn't understand it at all. <laughs> yeah, it was tough. Jamie, what was your thought uh, as far as, you know, after this meeting and, and for tomorrow's meeting? Yeah. Um, can you give me a little guidance there where, where you think that's headed for tomorrow? I think tomorrow we would look for you to, um, you know, approve approve the grant application as presented, um, making that change to the no weight on the on the um, uh, check all that apply, you know, the, the owned businesses type owned businesses. But basically, you know, in concept, approve the application, approve the frequently asked questions, and approve the scoring rubric so that we can keep on moving. We're just looking to. You know, now that we know where we stand in terms of the money, we we were able to, you know, we kind of had the ball ready to start it rolling. We want to keep it rolling now, uh, especially if, we, if we're, if we're going to be able to do a, a September 1 rollout with the application. So tomorrow, to answer your question, tomorrow, hoping for commissioner action to approve this this uh, Lebanon County CARES grant application and, and the FAQ and rubric that goes along with it. Now, I think, sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I was just going to say that we might want to include as part of that motion, the fact that we understand that this is a fluid process and there may be changes made in the application or the, the uh, frequently asked questions and so on. Yeah, Mr. Lutz. And maybe that helps me out a little bit because I, I was going to ask, are we approving what we see or are we going to get a fresh copy with the changes made? We will, okay. Then I'd I be more comfortable. comfortable. Jamie has a copy to distribute to you guys. I'd be more comfortable that way. She'll probably have it done before we even end this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> She's that good, huh? <laughs> 
It's been quick. Unless, unless she does another interview. <laughs> Are you mad at me for that? Come on. <laughs> Um, I would ask as well that if possible, and again, I, I'm not trying to talk out of turn, we have received one estimate only, it did not go to anybody else, but one estimate to create the application as an online electronic form. Um, that that um, estimate came from Fresh Creative. It was just trying to get a ballpark of how much it might cost and how long, how quick the turnaround time might be. Um, that estimate was about, I think, $670 to create yeah. uh, a web page, um, get the domain name for it, and create the secure site to accept that data. Um, and in whatever branding you decide you would like on it. What I would hope is that in the, um, in the, if the application becomes ready to approve tomorrow, that that next process may also be approved so that they can start building it with the knowledge that if changes still need to be made to the application, that can still carry through and up, be updated on the website. But at least perhaps the approval to start beginning that build so that when we are ready to release it, to the public to start filling it out. We're not waiting another three or four days for that to be built. That's a it depends on how we can cover that cost because we have to be careful because we've also been denied reimbursement for our costs related to COVID. So uh, we have to be careful how we spend money because I don't want the county to be on the hook for these uh, accessory uh, expenditures. I guess that kind of goes to my comment. Um, if indeed we have a PDF file that people can print out, fill in, and mail in or drop off with you, I don't know the advantage of letting them fill in online. Does it automatically do the Rubik's for you, or is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's, that's the advantage to that is that it, it populates a database and you know data entry isn't needed. Um, and all of that, and uh, you know, that six or seven hundred dollars is, I think, uh, and I, I understand where Bill's coming from. I, I, everything I've been thinking about is through that kind of filter too. But, but in this case, it's just a piece of, it's just a tool. It, you know, it's just a tool to make the whole application process go, go quicker and more available to people. I think, I think as many ways as this can be made available, the better off everybody is. So, having an online application, having a print PDF, having you know, hard copy. skywriting, however it comes about. I mean, it, you know, it ought to be available every way it can be made. I'm just a little concerned about hacking into their private information because it is on the internet, that's all. Well, and, and that's, the, that's the reason that it wouldn't actually reside on the Forward Together Lebanon site. It would go to a different site because that has to be set up with a secure server. Um, the site that Forward Together Lebanon was built using a different technology. So. Uh, that is certainly very critical. That was the number one point to make sure that the data capture on that site would be kept uh, secure. And, um, and the other, you know, when you go back and think about it, the time necessary to input all of that data by hand would be tremendous. You know, I'm not sure who would be responsible for that. Secondary to that, the, the opportunity to make a mistake in transporting that information into a spreadsheet by hand is also great. So then you have the liability of if somebody makes a mistake, which changes the scoring, which means that they didn't get their, their, their grant, then who's responsible? So I think the more that we can rely on the business inputting the data so that we, didn't, we don't touch it in any way, then the less liability we have for, for chance of, of um, issues. That doesn't mean to say that the ones that are handwritten um, will not have to be input, but if we can lessen how many of those need to be input, that's a really important factor. Well, then just one other question, if I may. Um, I know I read on your application that no changes can be made after it's filed. What if there's a glitch when they're filing or they get called away and it doesn't get completed, they're not going to get another chance to submit? Well, so the app, online application does not have the ability to create an account and store it. It is a, they, if they go on, they need to be ready to fill it out. It's, I mean, there's not a ton of questions, so they should be able to get through it in one sitting. 
if they if they have a list of the details that they will need in advance, they can make sure that they are prepared. I think if you add that level of security to put in a password and log in to save the information and be able to go back, then you're not only doubling the expenses, um, but you're creating a greater chance for hacking. Secondary to that, um, they can keep it open as long as they want. It is only until they hit submit that their changes cannot be added in. So, so if they have a power interruption, they can still go back at it when the power comes on? Well, no, because if their computer turns off, they have to start over again. But that, so the only way you could save it is if you created an online login and password code for them to be able to save it as an account. And for this type of application, that's a lot of technology that might be unnecessary. So they could start over. Yeah. They would start over. Absolutely. Okay. It would not that makes be me feel better. Yeah. Okay. And, it, and it's a relatively. And it's a relatively short application. I mean, it's. It is, but there's a lot of attachments. And so and that's so another, yes, that's another point, um, Joelle. And part of the issue, we, we looked at a lot of options with creating an online form. We looked at Google Docs and other places that already have forms that you can create. The issue comes down to the fact that we are asking them to upload documents. So to be able to upload a document and attach it to their application electronically is the, is the glitch that we had in using technology that might be free and more accessible. Um, and and that, was the, that was kind of a sticking point. Okay, uh, I'm, I think I'm caught up to you now. Uh, just questions I have to ask, things I've run into, problems I've run into filling in online grant applications. Absolutely. And I'm afraid I'm going to have to interrupt myself here. Um, I have to jump on our employer town hall at three o'clock. I would be happy to answer any additional questions that you have. Um, okay. I'll make the changes that we've talked about up to this point, but if anybody else has additional ones, just let me know, Jamie, or I'll send the documents. You can make them yourself, whatever you need, okay? Hey, thank you. Thank you all for your hard work. By thank the you. Yeah, I think thank you. Yeah. I, want, I, I want to just echo that. I mean, these, these these people have worked really, really well, and I appreciate everything because I don't have nearly the technology in most days, not the time, and I'm just, you know, spinning plates every on every poll. And so I really, really appreciate everybody's efforts so far, and you know, I really uh, feel good about all of us making this a success. So, okay. Thank you, ladies. To be a part of it, so I, I greatly appreciate the ability to share the things that I've heard from businesses and their needs and, and incorporate that into the process. So the, the, just the, um, the ability to be part of this has been tremendous. So I appreciate it too. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Bye. I don't know if I